Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Happy Monday, Manpreet. Where's the guitar? Beautiful weather. I don't know about that. Looks a little cloudy outside. It's raining. It is raining out there. <sighs> Are you in Buffalo, Java Lang error? Definitely rainy and windy in Buffalo. Oh, Long Island. I heard we were supposed to get like 70 mile per hour winds. Is that for real? Hello, Leanne. Welcome. I'm going to check my weather app. Okay. High of 60 degrees, windy tonight. Maybe it's tomorrow that's supposed to be really windy. Have you guys seen those pictures of like the before and after air quality with the quarantine? I'm trying to find some of those pictures. Like stuff like this. Air quality before and after. I saw one that was Los Angeles or something. That was like, wow. You've only seen the memes about it. <laughs> the memes. Pollution is down so the dinosaurs are finally returning. I haven't seen that. <laughs> now you can see Jupiter. <laughs> now you can see Canada from Punjab. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's pretty funny. Come on. <laughs> you can see the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Because of no pollution, I can see John Cena. <laughs> uh, I still can't see my future. <laughs> Is this a Tuscan Raider out here? That's not real. All right, that's pretty funny. <laughs> but seriously, you see like a, an improvement, a big improvement in air quality. <laughs> these are, <laughs> these like poorly edited, just boop, put that in there. Those ones crack me up the most. Uh. <laughs> oh, man. All right, how are you guys doing? Are you ready to talk about Project One? How's Project One going? Wait, is that Bowtie Mondays? Maybe. I found where my bow ties were located. Like, I thought I'd lost them, and now I found this little box. And now I might break them out more. You honestly just started yesterday on your project. Come on, man. It's not as easy as you think. Let's talk about it. So, um, I wanted to offer you guys some suggestions, just, um, uh, with how you. <laughs> you don't have to say sorry. Just get working on it. You have something but not sure if it makes sense. So I want to give you uh, some like ways to check if your solution makes sense. Um, and I'll take questions as we go through this and uh, how much work do you want handwritten all right we already got some questions popping in how about I go through a couple general things and let's see if this answers some of your questions and Ricardo has a subset of controllers but not all of your choices meet the transient just some of them okay <laughs> Project one not going great at the moment. All right. I wrote a, a couple points. This is the project one document. Um, so I give you I give you a plant for this motor. And this I got from doing system ID. So I think it's a pretty good model for the real system. So 
Wednesday, I hope to try out controllers that you've built and see how they work. It'll be fun to see. So this is the format of the controller I want you to use. And um, a lot of the questions I've gotten are related to, well, th there's two poles in this controller, beta one and beta two. And um, the examples we've done in class, there's just been one pole and one zero. So what do we do now that there's two? Um, we'll get to that. All right, so there's um, there's some transient performance criteria, like these first three. And then we have steady state. And this fourth condition, it's like it's a mixture of transient and steady state. But it's it's mostly having to do with what your controller does like right when you start up. Okay, and then obviously you know what you got to do. You got to show me how you picked your poles, how you designed your controller, and then you have to prove with simulation how you, um, that your controller is meeting those conditions, you know. So that's what items three and four are about. It's making those plots to prove that your controller works. And then the last step, this is this is kind of fun. This is the the line of code that you would put in your Arduino to make your controller work. So on Wednesday I'll pull up some Arduino code. I'll just substitute in the equations you guys have to see how they work. So that's that's the that's the project, but let me give you um, some items I was thinking about, and then I see there's some specific questions coming up, and, on, and I'll address those. But let me just address these general things first. Okay. So your first thing is based on conditions one through three you need to draw the acceptable pole region um, I've gotten some questions about like how can I automate this process in MATLAB, um, I know some of you have printers, so you can just print out the Z grid and um, you know sketch by hand. And if you can do that, if you can get a hard copy of a Z grid in some fashion, that might be the easiest way. Um, if you want to sketch these regions in MATLAB. Um, Really, there's no cure all, in my opinion. There's not like a super straightforward way, but I want to give you some tips. Um, you can use the Z grid command, and there's different ways to use it, but if you give it these arguments, so you give it a damping ratio, you give it a natural frequency, you give it a sampling period. You use paint 3D, is that acceptable? Yes, it is. What this will do, it will, you know, it'll plot the circle and then it'll do the zeta, it'll do the omega n. Oh wait, I just thought of something, I think we, Tested this before. Let me try this real quick. Let me show you how it works. 
let's say I'm just gonna like make something up here I'm gonna make up a system Omega N I'm making up like two natural frequencies. Uh, or I don't know. Now what I want to do, I want to see if I can. So I'll show you the Z grid command first. So you put in um, the natural, I mean, you put the damping ratio, you put the natural frequency, and then you put your sampling period. And it'll do this, like it'll plot. Wait, why didn't it do my natural frequency? It only did the zeta. Oh, the frequency values are interpreted as normalized values. Don't divide by the frequency by T. Oh. Frequency values are interpreted. So I should multiply by T to get omega N. Oh, okay. So I guess like it interprets it as omega n divided by, it's kind of weird and does it automatically. Okay, so um, Anyways, I wanted to see if you can put two things in there at once. Maybe I'll make like a zeta vector. Let me see. So I'll make zeta and zeta 2 go in there. Because I had to find two of them up above. Because I know you need to draw multiple contours. So let's try to Z-grid, but put in multiple things. Yeah. So you can plot multiple contours at once in here. I didn't know about this Z-grid command until somewhat recently. You can make a more sophisticated code that fills in all the regions and colors them. Um, that's what I did, but it, it takes some work to come up with that code. I use the fill command. I see some people in chat might have other tools that they're using. Plot tools for Zgrid, root locus, controller design. Okay. Made by a UB student. Probably.
Okay, so however you do it, you need to make your region, and then you need to um, it's on the MATLAB file exchange. Did somebody steal my code? Okay. So once you make that, to start your process, I would say pick one uh, combination of target poles. Some students have talked about like they right off the bat, they start iterating and they choose like a thousand different values of Z star and try to go through this whole design process. I would say don't do that. Just pick based on the region you find, pick one target pole to start with. And um, as long as this pole is within that acceptable region, if you can achieve those poles, then it should meet the performance criteria most of the time. So I wouldn't um, think you need to iterate too much on this. So just make, make your life easier. Just pick one Z star to start off. Okay. Now let's get to the issue of um, beta 1 and beta 2. So you have like two of them, right? Um, don't give this away, people. Okay, but I'm going to give a hint. I know a lot of you have already figured this out. Um, but look at criteria number five on here. This says that whatever controller you make, it's got to have a static position error constant KP equals infinity. Now, this means that you can't have any steady state error when you give, um, uh, a ramp, I mean, or a step, a uh, step input. So no steady state error for a step reference. Right. Um, Remember how we talked about system types? Different system types have different steady state errors for different step references. Okay, if you go and look up the system type that has no steady state error for a step reference, this is going to give you a clue about. Um, how to define one of your betas, okay? And I'll just leave it at that. So, what I'm saying is use criteria number five, and this will define one of your betas. And then you're just going to be left with one beta to, to choose. Is handwritten with typed up combination acceptable su for submission? Yes. In fact, I'd probably prefer that. Like, um, if you look at my uh, solutions, I think it's most clear if you, you know, you write out, this is my thought process, this is what we're doing, this is the main equation, and then you just like copy and paste in a segment of code that um, calculates whatever you wrote down by hand. I don't like the submissions where it's just, here's code. And, and probably if you've 
submitted something like that, you find that the graders will miss something because like your solution is like hidden in a line of code. So do yourself a favor, you know, write as much out you know, by hand as you can and make it really clear, like, here's where I'm calculating this. This is how I'm doing it. And then just kind of as an appendix, you say, here's the code that I'm using to, to solve that. So yeah, I'd prefer handwritten explanations or, or you can typeset it, but like write out your thought process. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're essentially submitting this as a homework assignment. And I, I updated the, it's on the assignments page. So now you can submit it as a PDF file. So if you go to assignments on UB Learns, you can submit it there. Okay, so let's say you figure out what one of your betas should be, right? Oh, no, it's, it's fine. Um, so what you do, I wouldn't go into like a code, an iterative code yet. What I would do Um, do yourself a favor and design one controller by hand. Likely, this controller isn't going to be the final one you settle on. It'll probably have some kind of deficiency. But if you do this once by hand before you go to a code, I find that a lot of times if you go straight to code, yeah, you end up confusing yourself, you end up having like some errors and whatever, and then you end up having to go and do some stuff by hand anyways. So I would say, first thing you should do, forget about going to code and iterating on your design right away. Just design one controller, do it by hand. Um, now when you, when you do this, I want to point out something. Let's talk about the angle criterion real quick. You know that, so this is the angle criterion. If you take your open loop transfer function, so that's G times D, if you evaluate it at the Z star you chose, so just pick one Z star for now. That should be equal to pi. And you know you can break these two things up. So what I'm getting at here is you can figure out what the angle contribution of D should be. So it should be pi minus the angle contribution of G. So this will be like, that'll be some number because you can you pick your Z star, you already know what G is. Chris, question. Hold your question, hold your question. All right. Um, now D, let's, let's expand that out a little bit. There's one pole and there's two zeros. I mean, there's, there's one zero and two poles. And remember, you know what one of those poles is. And if you don't know, you will figure it out by looking at criterion five. But I know that this is going to be the angle contribution of the zero minus the angle contribution of one of the poles minus the angle contribution of the, uh, the other pole. And so that's going to have to be equal to, you know, whatever this number is. So what I'm saying is um, you're going to define one of these poles. And so I'm just going to take one of them and I'm going to say that this angle contribution is known. So then you're going to be left with, you just have to pick one alpha and one beta. And it's going to be equal to 
this stuff. Jeez. And what I do Like you can you can do this in code, but I would just to start off just so you get a better handle on it. I would use a geometric approach here to figure out um a combination of alpha and beta that um their overall angle turns out to be this. Now, um, so what I want to get at is if you, not every alpha is going to work. You might find an alpha such that um, it creates it, it results in beta having to produce an angle that it, it that it can't produce. So let me explain. Like let's say let's say z star is like right here. I don't know whatever you pick it to be. Um, I don't know. I'm just making stuff up here, but. The biggest angle you can make, well, let's, let's just like put something over here. Let's say this is where I'm placing my, my zero. So I'm putting a zero here. I don't know, this looks something like a big 160 degrees or something. The biggest angle you could possibly make is if I move this like all the way to positive infinity. And if you move it all the way to infinity, then you can make you know, almost 180 degrees. But the thing is, you can't make a controller that has a zero all the way at infinity. or, or And you can't have a pole that's all the way at infinity. So, when you're, you know that the angle of this guy minus the angle of that guy has to equal, like, something. Neither of these can be bigger than 180 degrees. So you should um, actually, I have to explain this a little bit more. So I, I told you guys, I started putting some of our videos on YouTube because Twitch deletes videos after I think two weeks or something like that. So if you go, so if you just search like Dr. Estes on YouTube, okay, so we got, I, I put lectures up here. If you go to the lecture on March 27th, part two, right around, you know, nine minutes and 45 seconds, I talk about this same kind of problem of um, choosing alpha so that you can actually find a beta that 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 is less than 180 degrees and stuff like that um, okay so what I'm saying is before you go into MATLAB and start coding away, find one controller by hand. And, you know, just do like this geometric approach and find a combination of alpha and beta so that uh, it can meet this angle criterion. So solve for alpha and beta one. And then, don't just be satisfied with that. Test if it worked out. Test if it's actually satisfied. Because you might like solve by hand for alpha and beta and be like, okay, cool, I'm done. 
No, what you should do, plug everything back in. And this part you could do in MATLAB. Um, you could take your G, you could take your D, and you don't even need your, you don't even need your gain yet because your gain doesn't affect the angle. And check if it's equal to pi. If this isn't equal to pi, then it means you just messed up your calculations somewhere. No big deal. Happens all the time. Just go back and redo it and figure out what's going on until you get it right. And then only once you've verified this, next, solve for um, your gain. Jeez, my pin's giving me some trouble today. And this one, um, the way we showed how to solve for K, we used, we used MATLAB to do this, but it's just like two lines of code. Um, go back, run through the notes. And then, um, and then test if your magnitude criterion is satisfied. Because that's the point of the gain. It's supposed to make sure that this condition is true. So this is the magnitude criterion. So check this. So when I'm getting questions from students, these are the first things I'm asking you about your controller. Are you sure that the angle criterion is satisfied? Are you sure that the magnitude criterion is satisfied? So once you've checked both of these boxes, do another check. Solve for your closed loop poles. This is something This is something we use MATLAB for. So when I'm saying do this by hand, I'm saying like, look, you're doing this on a piece of paper, but when you need to do like one of these more rigorous calculations, just pop over to MATLAB for a second to verify. Um, and if you satisfied the angle criterion, if you satisfied the magnitude criterion, when you solve for your closed loop poles, Two of or the poles that come back, whatever you picked for Z star, you should see Z star in um, the poles. So there's three of them. Usually I pick like a complex conjugate pair of poles for Z star. So I, so two of those poles will be the ones I picked. I think some people were picking uh, a target pole that's just on the real axis. That's okay. So verify this. And if, if you see a problem here, like if the target poles, I mean, if your closed loop poles aren't matching the target poles, then it, it must mean that one of these con conditions wasn't satisfied. So that's why you should just check these along the way. If you see like, no, these are th the angle criterion is satisfied. The magnitude criterion is definitely satisfied. Then you know that there's just some error like in your code. Like maybe you built the closed loop transfer function in the wrong way. Um, maybe there's just a typo. It's, it's very normal to have typos in your code. So this is the only way that you can check and make sure you're not crazy.
you're like, no, no, no. I know that I did this right. I know that I did this right. So there must be a typo here. So that's what I do when I look at your guys' code. I'm checking, is this right? Is this right? So you want to do it in a very like structured way so that you don't go crazy. Because it's already crazy enough to be quarantined. Okay, let's say that you're like, okay, my target polls showed up in the closed loop polls. That is a major victory because that means that you have successfully designed a controller that gives you back your target polls, okay? But likely the third poll that comes back will be problematic in some way and that's what homework six is, was all about like uh or homework five as well like it that third poll it might be unstable it might dominate your target polls um it might be on the negative real axis shawarma okay and this this problem of the third poll this is what we deal with by um, iterating on our control design Now, what I mean by iterating on the control design is um, there's different ways to do this, but what I do is I try different alpha values. I don't I don't pick a new Z star. Usually you don't have to pick a new target pole. So I would say don't pick new Z star yet. In some cases, you may have to pick a new Z star or you may just be like, look, I think I can improve this controller even more. But if you're just trying to get through the project and that's what you should do the first time through, like um, it's better to just first make a controller that satisfies the criteria before you try to go crazy, like really optimizing it. So uh, I would say just stick with the Z star that you picked at the beginning. You picked it so that it was in the acceptable region. So it should be pretty close. So when I say iterate on your controller design, I mean, try different alpha values. So that YouTube video I showed, this is all about that as well so like lecture on 327 I think part one and part two are all about iterating on this controller design and once again when you're doing this make sure um so you're, you're um pick alpha values so that alpha and beta so that their angle contributions are less than 180 because you know that you can't you can't make angles that are bigger than 180 degrees or at least you know the magnitude of this <clears throat> um But yeah, if you if you can do this successfully once by hand,
before you get to this point of iterating, it's going to save you a lot of trouble. Because if you try to go straight to here, um, you're probably going to run into problems because we're all learning this right now. Like you're designing a controller, but you're also in the process of learning and finding out mistakes that you make along the way. So a lot of the bugs you run into, it's just some um, misunderstanding that you have with the concepts. So if you do it once by hand, that helps you to iron out the concepts and you'll be much more confident when you go to make a code. That's what I do all the time when I'm learning something new. Start simple. Make the first problem you do very easy on yourself and then make it more complex from there. Okay, so I think that was the basic advice I wanted to give to you. And then um, at this point, whatever questions you have, Abhijit says, Professor, after we get the closed loop poles from the acceptable region in the Z grid, is there any other way to check if it meets the transient characteristics other than the method where we calculate the characteristic equation, find the value of A, blah, 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 and plot it? Because when I did that, only the overshoot condition is getting satisfied but not the other transient characteristics. So yeah, the best way to check the transient characteristics is to plot it. Um, if, so when you choose your target poles, like the whole point of doing that Z grid thing and finding an acceptable region is so that I know that if I pick some poles that are in there, then the transient stuff should be automatically satisfied um, so if by the time you design a controller around that and you get to plotting stuff and you see that the transient isn't satisfied that probably means that either you picked maybe your acceptable region was wrong like when you were doing the z grid you might have messed that up and the target poles that you thought satisfied it they didn't so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that your third closed loop pole um, has a problem with it. Like maybe your third closed loop pole has, maybe it's slow. And so it's dominating the response and your settling time is screwed up. Crystal says, I have that question about calculating KP from our step response. Not sure how to do that. Um, you know the steady state error for a step response is 1 divided by KP. So if you look at your step response and you look at, like if you simulate it for long enough so that it achieves steady state, zoom in there, you know, see the difference between your desired reference and where your output actually goes and that's equal to 1 over KP. If there's no difference between them then 1 divided by KP equals 0 and that means that KP is infinite. Chris says since the plant has a numerical value not one with the angle we take the can we take the angle of the numerator as well? I don't know what you mean, Chris. Oh, oh, 1 divided by 1 plus KP. Okay, so yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I misspoke. But but same thing. Like, the only way that the steady state error is 0 is if KP is um, really big. Yeah, Chris, the, the plant G just has one pole. So you take the angle contribution of that pole. Did lecture already end? <laughs> well, we're today we're doing like a little workshop on project one. Uh, we're I gave some tips, but now I'm just taking questions. 
So don't include the numerator. Well, the numerator of the plant is just a number. So that's the same as the angle contribution of a gain. The angle contribution of just a constant is uh, zero. So we, we are including it, but it, it just turns out that the angle contribution is zero. Um, I have all of the, requ the requirements satisfied, but for some reason my ramp control is steadily increasing. When you say control, do you mean um, just your, your control signal U increases? Because that's normal. <clears throat> Think about what a ramp is for the case of a motor. Like we're specifying a certain speed. And a ramp is like I'm saying that speed is increasing, 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 increasing. If you keep increasing the speed of the motor, the voltage has to increase as well. And that's what our control input is. So it's normal to see that your control signal is increasing voltage. Uh, if my third pole is around minus 0.2, you're saying I have to pick different alphas so that it becomes positive. Wouldn't that cause us to get further away from the other two poles? The problem with a pole on the negative real axis is that it has any pole on the minus real axis has like a jagged oscillatory response and um, usually that's not desirable if you have a negative pole that's very close to the origin that means it settles really quickly and so it's less harmful in that case, because even though it oscillates a lot, it's only going to oscillate for a very short period of time, and then it won't be there anymore, so it won't bother you for very long. But in general, you should avoid having any closed-loop poles on the minus real axis. Ricardo has two questions. Throw them in the chat. How do you get the UK? You're talking about the difference equation at the very end? Use backward shifting theorem. Backward shifting theorem, ladies and gentlemen. It's a conversion between a transfer function and a difference equation. That's all it's doing. It's just saying like, look, you have a transfer function for a controller. Now give me a difference equation between the control input and the error signal. That's the equivalent relationship to that transfer function. So we study that with backwards shifting theorem. Lecture from March 6 has UK. Thank you. We're bringing back some relaxing tunes. hope this is helping you guys out. Once you finish this, you can say you've designed a speed controller for a motor. And you did, uh, and this is a digital controller that's tailored specifically to a certain sampling period. So it's like, it's not just a theoretical continuous time controller. This is like the real, this is the real deal, people.
We should be playing polka music for Dingus Day? Is today Dingus Day? Would I be able to upload the PDF that I'm building up? Sure, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. It's a little sloppy. It may not make sense if you weren't here for the lecture. Gerald, is there a Project 2? Yes, there is. Project 2 is I'm going to have you design a controller for that self-balancing robot. So we're taking it to the next level. When we submit this, does it have to be in report form? You could submit this just like a homework assignment. That's totally fine. Just be very clear, like you should be descriptive about your thought process. If it's really sloppy, not going to be happy. Okay, I plot my step response and all the constraints, including KP's infinity, blah, blah, blah. Those are satisfied, but the out output settles around two. No, you don't understand KP if you're asking me that question. If the output doesn't go to 2 pi, then KP is not infinity. If you're asking me this question, you need to go and study system types. You're getting ahead of yourself. Project 2 is doing a controller for the self-balancing project that can probably be used for the grad project? No. Well, I mean, not the same project. I assume you're not asking that, though. Uh, Ricardo says, the system ramp reference is just my time vector t with t being the sampling period. Great. Uh, the output should settle at 2 pi, right? Isn't that what the step reference is? Two times pi? Or what? Or was it pi? I, I can't remember. Step, yeah, two pi, right? Okay, uh, ramp. Because Rick is asking about the ramp. K times T. Time vector. Yeah, I think that's right, Rick, for the first part. Um, for the fourth constraint, there's not really much we can do to control the input voltage. Uh, it just depends on what Z star and alpha and beta values we pick. As long as we plot our control input and it does not exceed 6 volts, then that would be a controller we would consider and those that do exceed are no longer an option yeah that's right so I think the only way to really test so he's talking about um, condition 4 here when you design your controller you, ha you have to plot your like this is your control this is your control signal U, so that's the voltage that's going to the motor. You have to make sure that you design a controller that doesn't call more than 6 volts. Because I'm only using a power supply that is 6 volts, so I'm not going to be able to call anything more than that. Um, so the way we're testing that is you have to simulate how your system responds to a step of 2 pi radians per second. So that's one rotation per second. And if you see that your control input never goes above six volts, then you're okay. If it goes up to like eight, then your controller is like too aggressive. It's, it's calling too much control. You probably have to pick poles that um, have a larger settling time. Because if you pick and I think that'll automatically happen, maybe. Because I put a lower limit on the settling time, right? Like, your controller can't settle faster than 0.4 seconds. 
But it, like for example, if you wanted your to controller to settle in like 0 0.02 seconds, it would probably give you a control input that was really high voltage for the first step at least. Um, I think somebody asked, is there a way to check in advance if your control input is going to be bigger than 6 volts? Like, do I have to simulate it, or is there a mathematical check I can do? There... There... I think there is, but it's... It would be a lot of work. Because you would have to find the analytical solution for your control input and then you'd have to take the derivative because the the maximum control would probably be um, where the control input first reaches its peak which should be when the derivative is zero and, and I think you could, but it would be difficult. Okay. Last question from Rick. You don't want the plot for the ramp control and put just the ramp response. Let me see. Plot the system ramp response. So I guess I don't explicitly ask for the control signal. But I, I would put it. Just why not? But yeah, I, I won't, like, deduct points because it's not explicitly here. But it is interesting to see just, like, what it is. Take care, Rick. What other questions do you guys have? I'll probably hang around for another uh, five minutes or so. Okay. Jean says, when I type the code for the D transfer function, the last digit of the numerator does not show. Look for the the digner. What do you mean it doesn't show? Like just when you like put um just when like you put the transfer function in in MATLAB. Let's see. Like if I say. something like this it's it's like truncating two that's no big deal I think it's still there it's just uh yeah that's no big deal I think if you do format long let's see no Okay, yeah, don't worry about that, Jean. That won't make, that won't be, it's probably still there, it's just not displaying it. If it doesn't work, then your controller's probably wrong. It won't be a truncation error like that that causes it to be, it's not going to be a truncation error that screws up your controller like that. That means you have an error somewhere else. Beta formula work for beta 2? I don't know what you mean. 
Okay, Jean, then that doesn't work. And that's not acceptable because the whole point is that you're in control. Like, you pick some target bulls and then you prove that the controller is behaving as you specified. Like, if you just out of chance your controller works and you're like, oh, it's not what I designed it to be, but it's working, that's a really bad sign. So don't. That's not good enough. Okay, Ben says, I emailed you a photo of my Z grid. For some reason, I'm having a tough time selecting routes to start with. I keep getting weird Z star values. I don't want to get too far in and, and realize my first step was wrong. To start with. Let me see. Uh. Um, what's <laughs> this song is World of Warcraft tavern music. Uh, does this imaginary blah 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 work for finding beta 2? Um, I don't know. You should calculate it yourself and make sure. If you're if you're asking a question like that, I don't mean to pick on you. It just means but it means that you don't understand the concept behind it. If you're you should be able to derive that formula and answer that yourself. Like is that going to work? I don't say that to pick on you. I'm just saying you need to verify that yourself. Um, maybe it, maybe I'll stay like another two or three minutes, but I have office hours. I'm going to be back here at 3 p.m. Every Monday and Wednesday for sure. I'm here from around like 3 to 5 p.m. You can ask me questions. Um... So keep keep plugging away. Then let me find something to show you. Okay, Ben, you here? You want to go to this continuous versus discrete routes more detailed. When you click on this, it'll open this guy up. This is what you want. Because, like, if you start with some, if you start with some continuous roots, like some real part plus your imaginary part. Welcome, you be math professor. This is how you 
Um, I think this is a, a nice, reliable way of calculating this. Yeah, given a set of continuous roots, use this sine and cosine thing to get your discrete roots. It's going well, UB math professor. How are you? All right, you're welcome, Ben. I think this will help you out. Feeling groovy. You know, I figured out the problem with this white versus black text for my chat box. If you just make it red, then it works everywhere. I mean, it clashes a little bit sometimes. Falcon says, I'm getting a function that doesn't satisfy the angle criterion, has a third real negative root that dominates, but gets all of the parameters except for KV, which is extremely small. Not sure what I should make of this and where I'm going wrong. Could you kindly take a look later today in Oxar? I would love to take a look later. Um, <laughs> nay on the red. Um, but you got you should start with the angle criterion. If it doesn't, because that, that's the first thing you check. Even even if you have a KV that's really small. Um. So that's, that's great steady state performance for tracking a ramp, but it doesn't make up for those deficiencies, you know, in the transient. Plus, if the angle criterion isn't satisfied, that means you aren't even matching the roots that you originally chose, which is a bad sign. What's wrong with the, what's wrong with the red text? Oops. The tran the transient works. But if it okay, the transient might work, but this is the same thing that Jean was saying. If your angle criterion isn't satisfied, that means you're not matching the target poles. And that means you're you're not That means the controller is controlling you and not the other way around. You should control the controller. Okay? I forgot to mention I fixed my code from yesterday. I hit a single line to do a calculation weirdly. <laughs> it only took three and a half hours to find. I... Finding bugs in code... It's just not fun. It, it like always takes forever. Don't let the Velociraptors win. Listen to Ike. I did. Weird part, I did. You lined up with the poles? Falcon, if it. If it gives you poles that match your target poles, then it should satisfy the angle criteria. It should. Because that's what the angle criterion verifies. Debugging software. I fixed the error. Now there are three new errors. Yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> so Falcon, maybe you did satisfy it. But you are calculating your angle criterion wrong. I don't know. <clears throat> I started reading a new book yesterday. It's, um, what's it called? It's from the Wheel of Time series. Have you guys heard of that series? It's the first book in the series. I'm not, I told you I gave up on The Shining because it was way too depressing. It made me way too sad. Yeah. Because I've, with all this quarantine, I'm like, I'm going to read some fat, fantasy novels so I started with um, I finished yeah I, I finished that fat 
1,000 page book called The Wise Man's Fear. I know. I crushed it. Um, so, I was looking up like, what are the best fantasy novels of all time, you know? And The Wheel of Time came up. And then I learned that they're turning it into a TV series soon. Like, maybe it's going to compete with Game of Thrones and all that. The Wheel of Time. There's 14 books. You started reading The Wizard of Oz? No. Throw that. Throw it away. My thoughts on the Aragon books. I read... I think I read... I don't think I've finished any of those. They're pro I hear they're really good. My brother really liked them. I haven't read any of them though. Yeah, this is the one I'm reading right now. The Eye of the World. They have like, some big names that are gonna be in the TV series. Like, uh, I recognize, yeah, Rosamund Pike. Like she's really famous. They're really good, but dense writing. You'd recommend. Okay, I'll have to check that out too. <laughs> and and even Baby Yoda's in the Wheel of Time TV series. Have you tried any web fiction? They usually aren't as well edited, but have some really neat concepts. I feel like. I could get into web fiction after I've exhausted um, a lot of the existing fantasy novels out there. I feel like you go to web fiction when you've, I might be wrong, but when you've totally read everything out there and you're like, well, there's nothing else to read. And probably the people who do web fiction are like, they've, they've read everything. They're drawing from like Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, Harry Potter, they got it all in there. I haven't read Game of Thrones. Did you read it? My my brother Nathan, <laughs> fam I don't think you know what family values mean. Um, my brother Nathan listened to Game of Thrones on audiobook. And each book, you know, was between 30 and 50 hours of audio. He listened to all of them. And how many books are there? There's like five? Six? We got the time now. Game of Thrones books. A Song of Ice and Fire. You love the more casual style of web fiction and the ease of having it on my phone or desktop. I hear you. There's probably really good stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six. So, oh, there was only five Game of Thrones books out. Didn't the storyline diverge between the show and the books? I haven't even watched the show. I'm so, uh... I don't know. Last one was nine years ago? What? What is he doing? Oh, can I give you the option to resubmit? Is there only one submission allowed right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me fix that.
No, oh, there's unlimited attempts. There's already... Ray, it already says there's unlimited attempts. You can just resubmit already. Yeah. You're good. See it? Okay, great. Let's check on the status of COVID-19. Coronavirus. Uh, the worst is over. They have this really nice graph that shows I think we have reached the peak. I can never find this graph when I want to. Apparently now there's also a nice and deadly bird flu sweeping through? No. You're joking, right? Looks like globally. Yeah, 
cases by state. There we go. We're at the tippy top. Oh yeah, Mark, this is a, uh, this is tavern music from World of Warcraft. Okay, Jean, this would not give me exactly the given G, regardless of the format. What do you mean? If there's some like uh, digits that it's not showing as part of that transfer function, that's fine. That doesn't mean that it's not there. But yeah, yeah, it's it's fine. It's fine. Don't let that bother you. I don't know what the corrupted blood incident is. What are you talking about? In World of Warcraft? Actually, I listened to World of Warcraft music. I, I haven't played. I solved KV by hand and got a pretty big number. Making limit as K approaches infinity. 3.018, but my graph doesn't reflect this at all. You should find agreement between the graph and your calculations for KV. A pandemic glitch that occurred inside World of Warcraft? It was a disease that could spread through familiars outside of the boss arena it was supposed to be stuck in. Whoa! I'm gonna look this up. A couple research papers are written about it. Okay, Joe, you're saying, so if they disagree, where should I start? Um, okay, well, first of all, KV should be the very last thing you check, probably. Is everything else satisfied? Like, did you satisfy KP? Yeah? Uh, everything else is working? Okay. Um, how are you calculating KV? You solve for it by hand? Solve for it in um, MATLAB. See if it gives you the same. My design was done exactly as this very last lecture. I don't understand what might be going wrong. Also, the design and plotting goes as the last homework. Wouldn't that be the case? John, you're going to have to tell me exactly what your problem is. So, like, number one, is your angle criterion satisfied? Number two, is your magnitude criterion satisfied? Number three, are you getting the same closed-loop poles as the target poles that you specified? Okay, number four, where's your third closed-loop pole? And is it problematic? Is it uh, whatever and whatnot? You have to be very structured in the way you debug it. <laughs> what is this flaming cheese animal that you threw into the chat? You solve for KV in MATLAB and get minus 44. Okay, is that what you got by hand?
Okay. Catch you later, UB Math Professor. Okay, then, Joe, you need to go and figure out why they're not the same. Break it into pieces and see which part how they compare. All right, everybody. I got to eat lunch. I'm going to be back at 3 p.m. You can come back. We can deal with more questions. Um, keep debugging everything in a structured way. And you're going to succeed. You will see the end of this. All right.